Welcome to episode 382 of the AMPM podcast. My guest this week is Egla Radic. She's from Estonia and she's a big seller in the U.S. She's had a, a big exit. We talk about that and some of the pain points and some of what she went through. Very stressful times actually uh, during her exit, but she got through it and now she's in the process of running three new brands that she also plans to sell. Great inspirational story today from a really hardworking lady uh, that's just crushing it on Amazon. Enjoy this episode with Egla. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast for Money Never Sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said, are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host. Here's your host. Kevin King. Kevin King. Kevin King. Egla Radic, welcome to the AMPM podcast. It's so good to see you again. Good, good to see you again, too. It was London last time when we had a chat, so I'm so happy to connect again. I think it was, and uh, I think uh, we were at some, like, Danny DJs, uh, typically at his events, uh, like, on the night after the event, and I think we were there, and we were talking for a long time. It was me and you and several and people. Several. Mafia. I think this moment, Estonian Mafia just made a circle around you and we didn't let you go. You, you didn't, you didn't. You're like, you just captured me there and you're like, convincing <laughs> me like, you got to come to, come to uh, Estonia for, for the event. And then I never heard a word after that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, we need to go. We had to do a trade. You had to come to the billion dollar source. So I would come speak at I your know. event. And I never heard anything after that. That was the trade. And I wasn't ready to travel at this particular time. You know, I'm having, <laughs> I'm running three Amazon companies, so I'm not like away from it all. So it's been very busy. But you did take some time away. You took a little, I, I saw like on social media a while back in, uh, maybe it was the summer of last year, the summer of 2023, you actually took a little bit of time, right? Um, you were okay. able to get away, but you went to Mexico or somewhere. I was in Mexico and also I've, I've done crazy thing uh, like a personal solitude month in Spain uh, and that was ac- after an exit. So me and my team, we founded four Amazon companies and we sold one two years ago. But this exit story, well, it's just so crazy. So when we managed to pull it off, I just needed to unblock for like 30 days and just leave everything I know. And that was the Spain thing. But uh, the Mexico, Mexico experience is more like for female entrepreneurs, you know, when we're executing every day and we're being in charge there is a place in like a female body that wants to have the feminine embodiment part back in you so i was kind of getting in touch with that in mexico well that's awesome that that's i mean i think that's important a lot of people you all they do is work 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 they don't make time for themselves and uh the, the fact that you did that i think is is super important more people need to do that were you totally able to disconnect or were you still having to check in or do you have was your team able to handle everything? You could just disappear for 30 days. Uh. My team, my team of uh, seven, eight people, together with me is eight people. Uh, we Right now we run three Amazon companies. They are so auton- autonomous on what they do. Uh, I, we do have a COO uh, also in place. And uh, I was able to be completely off grid for 30 days in Spain. Uh, all I had, I blocked all my apps. Uh, I didn't check anything. I only had one book and my phone, which was only in calling and SMS mode. Uh, in emergency case, you could reach me by but I could not check on any emails or any social media. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what was it like when you came back? Was it because I know like every time I go to a conference or something, I come back, it's like I got to catch up on so many things. It's like you feel you're nice to be relaxed and you come back and you're like overwhelmed. I know everything, everything waiting for you. But for this time, I, we already had a COO in place. Uh, so that took a lot of uh, stress off my shoulders. Hey, what's up, everybody? Kevin King here. You know, one of the number one questions I get is, how can you connect to me? How can I, Kevin, get some advice or speak with you or or learn more from you? The best way is with Helium 10 Elite. If you go to h10.me forward slash elite, you can get all the information and sign up for Helium 10 Elite. Every month, I lead advanced training where I do seven ninja hacks. We also have uh, live masterminds and uh, every single week. One of those weeks, I jump on for a couple hours and we, we talk shop, we talk business, do in-person events. Helium 10 Elite is where you want to be. It's only $99 extra. 
on your Helium 10 membership. It's h10h10.me.me forward slash elite. Go check it out, and I hope to see you there. For those of you that don't know, you're in a in Estonia, right? Yes, it's a northern European, cold and a little bit dark country, but we're very e-centric, so everything is digital. Yeah, I've actually been to I've been to Tallinn, uh, oh, to cool. Estonia, and I, I liked it. I mean, the the fort, uh, the wall that goes around the city, and when you walk yes. in, you know, into the downtown part, it's like uh, all that old medieval kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's kind yeah, of it's, UNESCO heritage thing. It's, it, you, you really step back to the medieval um, scenario. It's really fun. Yeah, I remember when I was there. It's been a while since I was there, but y'all are just switching over to the Euro, I think. You must have been here a long time ago. If it's you come here, oh, it's 10 years ago, 10, 12 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Completely changed. I mean, we are, as a former Soviet country, so we are catching up with you guys really, really fast. It's been 30 years since we've been free, so we're still running to get you. Yeah, you got, I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurship in Estonia. That even back when I was there, the advancements, and a lot of people think of like the old Soviet countries uh, that, that broke off as, you know, backwards or, or whatever, and it's not. It's very forward thinking, very high tech. Because this is the only way how people could actually create and that, that, that's the way how we can catch up with you, the Western world, America, you know, we need to step into our power and we need to start creating ourselves. And that means that we need to create companies and the salary work only is not enough sometimes to catch up and create the wealth that we have been missing so long time. Now, now your background though, before you got into this whole Amazon game running uh, three different companies, like we'll talk about that in a minute, but was... Didn't you do something, uh, journalism or something? When did television? I am. Yeah, I'm a master in journalism, but before I started that, I actually tried to study gene technology. Don't ask me why. I mean, I cannot imagine myself running around with white outfits and being in, a, you know, with all these little glass jars and chemicals and things like that. I was like, after 30 days, I was like, no, I'm not. Just get me out of here. So I just escaped to being an au pair in, in Minnesota in States. And oh, after really? that, yes, I thought that let's get like a general um, education, which is journalism and media so i do have a master's but i i do not like to consume media i don't like to participate in a written media i'm very comfortable on being like on a you know podcast and doing filmings but uh, i don't know why i studied it i guess you just wanted to understand the world really so did you ever actually work in that field or you just yes. got you did for a while yes. just- i was rather like managing different departments in a big media outlet so in Europe or in the U.S.? In, in uh, no, in Estonia here in Europe. So you came to the U.S. Uh, and we're in Minnesota. Did you did some studies as well as your up here stuff here? Or? Really, I was just babysitter. You know, I just had to get away from this gene technology thingy. So that was kind of like a gap year uh, from the high school to becoming a real grown up person. <laughs> okay. And so then, what did you actually end up doing? What were you doing before you got into the Amazon game? I am a hopeless case, really. Um, I seen after all these um, middle management positions I held in big companies, I was always holding a sidekick and just not one, but uh, maybe five different companies I was running in different times uh, when having children, when doing the salary work and they didn't really... Um, Come on, logically. Uh, one company was doing interior architecture. Another one was doing touristy, you know, stuff to buy and sell in a, in a tourist shops. Um, another company was doing um, digital advertising, and then I was also coaching a little bit. Um, I did something else as well. I just can't, can't remember anymore. Um, and they just all came one after another. I was just kind of what I'm trying to say is I was searching and I wasn't putting myself in a box that, you know, I have a media background. So maybe I start to uh, produce content or maybe I start to be a blogger or something. I was just all over the place. And I just want to encourage people to take the borders away from yourself and just, you know, whatever calls you, go and try to do it. Because in my case, from going from interior architecture to, I don't know, digital marketing, it's completely different era. But nowadays, every all the information is available. And if you have passion, you can just get yourself up to speed in, in some time. Awesome. So you did these were for other company. You're working for other people, but then you then you uh, at well, some point start doing. You had started like a digital marketing agency. Or yeah, something. from the yeah. side as a, as a side gig. Yes. What what by digital marketing? What does that mean? You're running Facebook ads. You're doing SEO, or what were you? What were you yeah. doing? Yeah, 
yeah, all of that. I was, I was a company like they called man and the dog, you know, just me and myself, but I was doing this big, uh, the TV tower, the maritime museum, you know, the big like objects here in Estonia who were launching their presents. So I had some big clients, um, but uh, it was just me <laughs> doing all of it. So did you find out about selling e-commerce or Amazon and specifically during that time when you're doing the digital marketing or that come a little bit later? That came uh, when me and my then husband, right now ex-husband and business partner, we decided that we want to take like a cap year completely away from Estonia. And we went to live in Asia. So we were living in all possible countries in Asia, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in, uh, we were in Kuala Lumpur, and then we ended up in Bali. Um, and then I just, I was just swimming across this woman in a pool. Um, she was a police um, assistant. And she started to share about that, that she shared, she, she's selling for 3000 bucks a month, she's selling a popcorn chocolate pizza in Amazon. I was like, what is that product? And what is that platform? Like, I need to dig deeper because I've never heard of something like that. And I kind of figured like, you know, from all what she said, it sounded complicated and it sounded like, you know, I started seven years ago, so there wasn't too much information around in 2016, 2017. So I kind of had to put all the puzzle pieces together by myself mainly. And I kind of liked it because I kind of like to venture in places that other people haven't been, you know, occupying so heavily yet. So that was kind of thing that got me started with Amazon. Did you just, did you take a course from somebody or did you just no. learn by watching what was available back this 2016? Yeah, I just few, learned. Few YouTube videos and a few Facebook groups and stuff like that. Just little. Yeah, you just became big when I started. Um, you were in this group and then you popped up as a celebrity, you know. I remember watching that from the <laughs> side. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. So I really will... admire this dude. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I had no intention on actually going down this route. I actually started, uh, some people have heard the story, but I started with this podcast, the AMPM podcast yes. that, that I'm now hosting. And I, yeah. Manny Coates was running Helium 10 and asked me to come on it. And I was like, no, I'm just a seller. I'm just trying to launch some brands. He's like, no, come on. And it's like, so I did. And now look what I'm doing now. Now I'm hosting the damn thing. Oh, yeah. Um, Manny's like, podcast was my favorite. I listened to every single minute he put out. So that's how I got started, actually. That was my support. That, that was me, too. Back in 2015, I mean, I, I watched, I think it was Amazing.com. was like, I think it was AMZ4 back then. Mm -hmm. And they did a series of videos, like four different videos uh, to, to pitch you on the uh, on buying their $5,000 course. And I was like, I don't need to do this. I, I've been doing this. I already know all this. So I just launched it myself. And then but to consume content, like you said, I was uh, I was actually listening to the AMPM podcast. Uh, There's only like three or four of them. Uh, it yeah. wasn't like like in the software tools. There was very few out there to do your keyword research. It was kind of a, a figure it out on your own kind of thing. Yeah, so these were the times where we were able to listen to every single podcast out there for Amazon. I remember. <laughs> yeah, you're like, is this all there is? There's three. Is there another one now? There's like a hundred. I counting the other day because we're working on a tool right now to uh, to to actually summarize them all for a uh, uh, for my newsletter for a special tool like a weekend edition. And there's 117 oh. uh, podcasts in the AMs that I know of. I'm sure there's some that I are. Uh, uh, I don't even know of, but 117 in English. It's totally different, uh, totally different environment now. So, so you saw, so you you met this girl in Bali. You were swimming. She says she's making three grand a month, and so you started diving into it. What what was your first product that you launched? It was kind of like a fruit basket thingy. Uh, I did. I mean, fruit basket was the kind of the first product that I actually succeeded on. And my my like definition of succeed was like I was selling three units a day. So I was like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> because my background was that I was trying to launch baby bandana drooling peeps, and I failed miserably because I entered already back then there were such a thing as saturated market. So that was in 2007. It was definitely saturated market. So I was just thinking, yeah, but my designs are cuter and my listing is better. No, when you don't earn and you, or you don't know how to get to the first page. I mean, all of us, we are going to learn this sooner or later with a hard way, right? Uh, and then you just keep away from heavily saturated markets. I was doing this drooling peeps and I was doing something else. Um, and then... 
You know, we kind of started with my uh, ex-husband. We started to like the produce also in Indonesia. Uh, and that was a crazy, crazy adventure because we had all these wooden arrows and clothing and, you know, decor and clothing, basically. So we loaded up like a whole container um, while doing well, fruit basket. While, while, yeah. you were, while you were in Indonesia, you loaded up, like when yeah. you source it yourself, not, not, not on some website or something, but like, Going into the little local craft shops and little craft yeah. people. Yeah, we rented this. We rented this scooter and we were just driving around. They have like an industrial street over there where they have the small presentational shops. So it was dusty. It was really hot, and you're just driving from one place to another. And then you see these Mercedeses, and then these peak guys are coming out and just going in. And you know the doors are closing. Nobody else gets in, and you understand these are the peak guys, you know, the peak buyers. And then we go sweaty and looking like average and don't even know how to negotiate and, you know, going and waiting when the doors open so we can enter. <laughs> but, but we loaded the container. I did all the research. They were not saturated markets. Two mistakes here. The containers, papers from Indonesia were done wrongly. So we couldn't really um, enter all the products to America. So we had to abandon most of them. So you're doing, you were doing clothing from Indonesia? From Indonesia. Yeah, we did like decor and clothing. So we just had like... The Valley is known for more decor, decor right? There's a clothing there too. They have oh, clothing too. Yeah. Oh, they do? Okay. Okay. I wouldn't say Bali is the best place. I I, I would go for Java uh, to source uh, clothing. The rest of Indonesia, Bali, it was just accessible for me. So that's why I did it. But the reason why we did Indonesian project at all was that we were getting cocky. You know, you don't need too much to get cocky. I had these three sales uh, of a fruit basket a day. And then we had another like office product that we discovered at the time that right now is sold as a full portfolio um, for multi-million dollars. And we were like, yeah, the sales are coming in. Let's just, you know, let us go there and just let's blow up blow, blow big and let's just invest as much as we can. Let's ride on the edge. And we were losing like 25 grand when we started out because, you know, we just weren't able to handle that such a speed and also the paperwork. How did you finance it in the beginning? Was it just your own money or did you yeah. have, yeah? That hurt. That really yeah. hurt because at this time we had three kids and we were building a house and being away from home and having all these costs of plane, plane tickets and three kids and, you know, five people traveling and stuff, you know, it wasn't easy to put aside like 30 grand to start a business. And, but in Estonia, luckily we do have the maternity leave for like 18 months where you get your full compensation for the salary. So most of it actually went to the Amazon black hole <laughs> that I received from the state. <laughs> well, 18 months of full salary. Yes. Full salary. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, that's wow. a really good place to get started with any entrepreneur. entrepreneurial. Oh, journey. wow. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's incredible uh, that they do. That's, that's, I never even heard of 18 months of a uh, full salary for maternity leave. Uh, that that's cool. So you were starting this in in Indonesia in in, in Bali, and then so this one kind of didn't work. What what did you pivot into something else, or did you just mm. keep keep at it and keep persistent and, and kind of figure it out? Yeah, I kind of lowered my ego. I lowered uh, lowered expectations that I know it all because that's how I felt really. Uh, so I went back to the drawing board. I started to look, you know, where we made the, all the mistakes. Um, definitely went back to sourcing from China. So the papers wouldn't blow up on you and then not to launch many products in the same time when it's just you and maybe 25% of your partner helping you, you know, you can't do 20 products in the same time. It's just way too much. So I just went back to the drawing board and I discovered, um, uh, the portfolio that we sold uh, and it was in office, office category. So we really started to develop that. That was like 2017, 2018 when you started that? Yeah, yeah. And that's the one that you just, you sold in 2022 or 2023? The, actually 2020, at the end of 2020. Did you sell it to an aggregator or a strategic buyer or? Aggregator, European an ag aggregator. European uh, aggregator? Yeah. That was a, you said that was a seven figure exit? Yes. How many SKUs were in that? Um, we, we're kind of having always the same formula. Uh, we're having about 25 SKUs. Each of them need to do about 17 to 25,000 a month, uh, you know, with a net profitability for 20%. And since we figured that formula out, that's like a medium multi, a multi, um, multi seven figure exit over there. And once we figure about $5 million about right? that, yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can do your math. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> even though we can't talk about the numbers, but when we figured out this formula, you know, we before that we um, failed with having a hero product uh, because Amazon shut it down uh, on this office category brand that we sold, and that was doing really majority of the revenue, um, and then. For our kind of like a winning formula, we figured out that we do not want to have hero hero products. Um, and the reason why Amazon shut it down was really silly. It was like a category issue. You know, they're having these huge databases. They're moving data. Something gets stuck, and you can't unstuck it yourself. You're just against AI. The human on the phone says that yeah, manually, I'm I'm changing it. And then when the big data starts to run the cleanups or something they you know shut you down again so we were at the middle of actually in an exit process when this happened so that oh, wow. was like a 12 month uh delay to our exit because there, there was nothing to sell but thanks to that we figured out that we no longer want to build portfolios that are heavily reliant on hero products so that's why we're doing 25 SKUs and about 20,000 a piece. And that's what we're doing with the ne next three companies now. We're almost feeling like a kindergarten, you know, just bringing up these little companies to a bigger company and then handing over uh, to somebody who, who wants to take them from there. I think that's a really smart approach. And that's one of the approaches I advise a lot of people to do is don't try to, too many people have, it's, 80% of their sales come from one or two products. That is so dangerous. It, it's so it's so dangerous. And some people are, uh, have been successful with it. I know people that had one or two products and they exited with one or two products uh, for, for a large amount. And it's worked for them. But for most people, it's too dangerous. And also, I always tell people, don't shoot to be number one. You know, usually a hero product oftentimes is going to be one of the top one or two or three best sellers in a category. And I always say that depending on the category, if it's a really sub niche, that's maybe okay. Um, but for most, you don't want to be there because you're just a target for, for hackers, for people, price wars, for all kinds of crazy stuff. So your yeah, approach of 20 to 25 and just be middle of the road, steady. Mm -hmm. You don't have nearly the, num the amount of issues. Um, and that's the way to do it. And you, you basically prove that out uh, with what you did. I mean, we figured out that this is so much less stress, including way how to do business. Amazon is high stress level entrepreneurship. This is not for people who love to be chilled. Uh, so <laughs> this is a way how you can actually survive in this battlefield. When you're going under the radar, not running on the, you know, against the bullets and stuff with your flag, flag out. Hey, here I am with this, all this amazing revenue, you know, coming out in a black box and stuff like that. No, you, know, you just want to be secret, quiet, unsexy, doing all the products that are not really, you know, glamorous, stuff like that. So that's why basically we've been sticking with the P2B categories, doing the things that business buyers need. Um, but that's so funny, like in Estonia, all the guys, like we have a really strong community over here. All the guys are doing like feminine things like, you know, <laughs> facials and shampoos and, and stuff like that. And the women that I know, they're, we're doing like metal and plastic and, you know, industrial and like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yep. Um, whatever works. I mean, there's some really big sellers in Estonia. So that, that's yes. it's, it's obviously working uh, for, it's a very good, that community is very tight uh, and very, uh, uh, and there's Latvia too also has, uh, which is n next door over there, that has a, quite a big community as well, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what's the third country that's over there? Um, it's Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. and which Lithuania. one? Lithuania. Lithuania, that's right. Uh, all three of those actually are pretty strong in entrepreneurship and is pretty strong in, in Amazon. Uh, that's true. But we don't really communicate amongst like Baltic states or amongst our, our, the companies or, or the, the countries. It's more like internal. And then we, when we go to conferences, it's more like international community. So... Was this the brand you said that uh, it was an adventure to sell it? Um, is this the one that you were talking about that, uh, that you went to Spain afterwards? Yes, I was broken after selling this company. It's because it's your baby or because of... Uh, baby, but listen, we had, we had Northbound Group uh, helping us. And uh -huh. they did an amazing job. And they said, yeah, guys, let's exit. And then our hero brother got shut down by a really stupid category issue that we were fixing basically three, four, five months. Yeah, four or five months for sure. So we lost. You were under, under LOI. And then yes. You're under, and your hero product 
So you were you were already kind of celebrating and doing the work. So you're like, all right, I'm going to have a bunch of money hit my bank account soon, and then all of a sudden, boom, you had. I a know. Crisis. I know. I wish this experience to nobody. Honestly, I don't. Um, I can shed some light on what happened. So anyway, we were in the middle, like we had a, like many, many prospects that we could sell to. We were already sent out all the presentations and we were ready to go. And then we lost like 75% of the revenue, which is like, oh my God, what are we doing? We are paying the consultants. Yeah, you know. We are already thinking that we don't want to let the team go. We are starting two new companies. They're taking only uh, expenses. They're not bringing anything back. And at the same time, we're losing all the revenue. Like, how do you navigate this? Like, there is no profitability. And then uh, the COVID hits as well which is another thing. It's almost like a perfect storm. I might be making a mistake. When did I exit? Was it? Anyway, we, it also collided with, we lost the main, main product and then the COVID hit as well. So when we got it back for like seven days, we were selling amazing because we were dominating this niche. We got it back and then the COVID hit and this main seller, you know, it lost kind of the appeal for the customer because there was the office category thing and all the business mm-hmm. buyers, they were sent home. And at home, people did not really need the office set up in that way that we were catering to. Um, so we were battling really heavily with trying to convince Amazon that we are in the right category and also then figuring out that we are completely flatlining lining our business. Even when we get the hero back, the COVID has flatlined our business. The buyers don't want to buy a company which is flatlined and lost the profitability. So um, then something like we got a piece of advice, I think, that's really what broke me, but that's also what saved us, was that the consultant said that, Egle, we know this is COVID. We know you're going to get your product back. Just keep battling. Uh, but sit down and, you know, close yourself to your home. Don't come out. Create an additional portfolio of that, which is making a profit of 500000 a year. Show me this profit. So we are going to package this with your broken company, <laughs> which you're fixing right now. So we can have like a forecast for the buyer, which is proven by the data and, you know, the searches and the volumes and actual benchmark products over there. But you only have three weeks time. I mean, you don't have that much time. Um, and I had three kids at the moment. I was like, you know, already separated, but I was parenting them. And I mean, I had it was almost impossible to do. And I just told my ex that, listen, just forget about me for three weeks. Uh, let me close myself to my room and to my, or to my apartment. I did. And I figured out how to make 500,000 profit uh, with actual Amazon products. Um, we packaged it. By this time, we got the product back to the, to the you know, market. We didn't break, the break down anymore. But that was almost... I would say 18 month pro- progress, that um, process that we were so broken, so hopeless. We were, you know, missing about 300K every month to pay our Chinese suppliers. Uh, it was so hard to pay the salaries for our two new companies, people working over there already. Uh, not even talking about keeping the old company running. So that was really something that I would not advise anybody to go through, but that comes with entrepreneurship sometimes that you don't know if you're going to survive or you're going to, you know, you don't know if you're going to lose your home or no, because I mean, my home at this time was worth like 150,000 euros and, but we were owning 300,000 to Chinese suppliers. So like <laughs> even if you lose my home, it's not going to really help anything. I mean, I'm still in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so you were able you were able to work yourself out of that. That that's awesome. Um, was your was your ex was he a partner in that company or he still is? Yeah, oh, he's, and he's I in the two new ones as well. Yes, yes. Okay, so you're on friendly terms. Absolutely, we okay. we agreed that we are going to do conscious uncompanying. Uh, so this is something that um, you know people teach already too. So this is a beautiful process. If anybody needs to, you can just Google, and that's that's a good way how to be a strong partner from what you had before. So you're actually not divorced then? We are. We are divorced. I thought conscious uncoupling was um, because I just went through a divorce as well. So, uh, but so I, I I thought that was actually where you would you 
separates and you don't live together necessarily, but you come together occasionally? I think it's a term in United States for that. It's living apart together. Uh, yeah, you're, yeah, that's it. That's it. yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's you're right. That's it. I'm yeah. Uh, yeah. Conscious uncoupling is like, how can you preserve everything that's wonderful in your relationship, but let go with love and ease, what doesn't serve you and your partner anymore. And, you know, just keep nurturing the children and the friendship and in our case, the business and the partnership in that, but giving him free for another love um, that any anybody wants to be loved. So, yeah, I mean... That was a beautiful way to figure it out. No, that, that's really cool. What's that like actually working with your your partner? I mean, when I mean, you went through a lot there together. I mean, you, you went. Th- I mean, it's almost like you almost lost a, it's like almost losing a child or something. Uh, you know, with with the business and the stress, and where y'all are tra- traveling around, and then um, you have the stress of that, and then you're able to get through all that. That's that's pretty strong of you. That's pretty good. That's pretty crazy. I remember one episode. We just lost the hero and we were so stressed out. Like he was, he was willing to do all the phone calls to a support center. And in Estonia, you have to start doing them 4 PM because you guys wake up in States and uh, it was, you know, dark and it, it, it was about the same time right now. It's just getting dark, like 4, 4 PM anyway. So we were thinking, oh my God, we're just so miserable. Um, let's go to a place that's a little bit warmer. So even when we are so miserable trying to save this company at least we have sun shining on us and the kids can be on the pool you know we can be sitting on the phones and troubleshoot all this thing and it's just gonna be so much merrier but and then we decided to go to turkey and we had this wonderful all-inclusive resort you're taking your your whole family right yeah the whole family the three kids and you know we went together and that was the early days of conscious uncoupling so we thought that yeah we can still do it together you know get through it together um and we went there and it came out there is no internet there's no way to do a skype call without the internet (laughs) i mean it's going to be so expensive to use your european uh roaming to call to Mm -hmm. uh, states that's not possible because we all know you know calls with support center and irs they're like 60 minutes for sure i mean you have to be sitting there and and that would be handing up like many hundred dollars per call and you have to do like 50 of them to troubleshoot sometimes so we were like yeah, we have all the sunshine, but we are even in a bigger trouble right now. <laughs> so my partner, like he figured out like next to this grand piano, there is like a tiny bit of internet that's enough for Skype. So he was sitting the whole day, he was just sitting there tiling the number. And then like he put it on a loudspeaker so I could hear, you know, and he was just saying like, yeah, you're going to be served next and let, let us call, you know, let us get, through, get you through the agent. And the craziest moment was that he, he's been trying to reach this agent for like four days and he heard the message, we are connecting you to the real human agent right now. And the phone call dropped. Oh, no. Oh, and no. Went, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the company was just breaking down any minute because the hero was down and, you know, we were needing this cash. And Amazon was writing, you know, guys, you have about 70,000 units in a storage. Uh, it's been sitting there for three months. How about we just go ahead and destroy it? And we were like, no, you guys, you guys closed it. You, you can't destroy it. I mean, if you destroy it, basically you're going to destroy me because that's all we have. We were just sitting on his inventory. So we were just thinking it's no point to call. We just went to the pool, went to the sun, you know, hanged out around our three days, came back, and then just dived into all these crazy phone call sessions again. And then eventually managed to bring the company and bring, bring the hero back back to life. <laughs> now, why in the world with all of this would you do it again? What, what, <laughs> do it again? I mean, some, some of your friends might say you need to go to therapy for, after going through all of this. 70,000 products stuck and they want to destroy them and your life is you're going through all this and now you're doing it again with three other companies. Kevin, what, 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 do, do you need to send a doctor over to you or something? Or I, what, know, what? I was in heavy therapy. Why do you think I had to go to Spain <laughs> to turn off all the earthly communications? I mean, I had a reason to do a solitude. <laughs> But given in the right mind, what are the chances that such a mayhem can happen to one person again? I think my insurance policy is pretty good because the chances for me to go through the same mayhem 
are very small because I've gone through it already. And even if it does, you know how to deal with it. And so yeah. you know you know exactly how to, I mean, that's what people always say. They'll, they'll start on Amazon uh, and it's like, oh, this doesn't work. Uh, you know, that's that's so like five years ago. This is this doesn't work. I'm like, no, it works. I lost one point three million. Well, me and some partners, I personally lost three hundred grand, but one point three million dollars during COVID selling on Amazon. Yes. And people are like, why the heck would you keep doing this? Because it's the best business opportunity that's ever existed in humankind uh, if you do it right. And you, like you said earlier, entrepreneurship, you're full of ups and downs. Mm-hmm. And if you're not. Uh, that's not for everybody. And yes, you don't want to take risk and to to live on a couch and uh, you know do whatever you gotta do to get get there. Then you're probably not gonna get there. I heard your story losing more than one million dollars. That was when I heard that. I was actually kind of in the middle of my mayhem, and I was like, "Listen, Kevin is going through that. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get okay. I'm gonna be just okay. Mine is like four times smaller trouble than he's in. So that was a support." In yeah, my mine, 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 I mean, I didn't almost lose anything, but between us, we lost that much. And but I had a loan with like sellers funding. Mm-hmm. Uh, now they're called Sellers Five. They changed their name, but um, really great company. But I had a loan. I personally guaranteed it. And mm-hmm. so, and then I have my reputation also, you know, because I'm public out there. So there's no way I could let that that go. So out of my pocket, I was paying fifteen thousand dollars every two two weeks to, out of my own personal account to to pay that off and. They ended up working with me. I, they knocked it down, called them, and said, "Hey, this is we're close, closing this company. I got to switch the payments to my personal account. Can we knock it? Can we? I'll pay a little bit more interest. Can you knock it down a little bit just to write it out?" And they they did. They worked with me really well, but paid the whole thing off. But I'm doing it, still doing it, still selling. Um, and I think that's a, a lesson for a lot of people: is don't give up. If um, even though it can be stressful at times, the opportunity are huge. So are you building these new three companies to sell them as well? Are you, is that your yes. intent? Yeah. So, so now you know how to do it from day one. So you've mm-hmm. been through the process of what documents do you need? What are they going to look for? So you, it should be much smoother selling for you. Should be, but we still made a bunch of mistakes. Maybe something I want to share with the listeners and watchers right now is we had this another, like a second, like a first company started like pretty well. Um, the problem with the first company is like we hit seven figures pretty easily. It maybe took 12 months, uh, I don't know, 14 months. We were like up and going seven figure. And then I was looking at the profit and loss and I was like, where is all the profit? You know, what's going on? And that was like two years ago. Uh, so that was a lesson number one that I don't think nowadays business in Amazon is any more possible when you don't do category optimization, you don't do size optimization, and you also don't uh, consider, you know, the velocity sweet points. And the reason why you have to be a product that's not necessarily more expensive than your benchmark product or the Chinese is that the PPC is the most profitable unit in Amazon, you know, ecosystem right now. It's more profitable than Amazon Web Services. Yeah, it's 40, uh, 40, 40 plus billion dollars in profit. It's, I think that's crazy. And that's, yeah. you know, all the old people who are jumping in and learning from the old system that launched with PPC. And PPC needs to be like integral part of your business. But uh, I would say that... Uh, that, that that needs to be overlooked. Uh, we cannot go to a market situation where the first page is heavily populated with very similar products and you going there with $2 more expensive product that has a better value proposition, but organically wouldn't sell as many as you know the top velocity products are selling. That means that you're missing out from the organic uh, visibility, which anyway is really hard to get. It's like, what did they say? Um, 67% of the purchases are done on the first page and first page is basically 80% of BPC slots. Uh, So our only chance actually to get organic purchases is to occupy positions one to four or one to five, depending on your screen width. Um, And if you don't consider that and if you're only relying on BPC launches, uh, I don't think this game is, is really profitable and that's what happened to us. So 
we had to kill a bunch of products that were wrongly and in a wrong, in a, I would say, in an old business model way launched. And we had to start seeking for markets that are not so saturated. So right now we would never, ever launch a product when the market is saturated. We don't do products that there are more than like half a page of direct competitors because we need the organic visibility. It just, it's you, a big it's just not carrying us too far. It just eats everything you make. Are you doing products? Are you developing your own products from scratch? Or are you still finding stuff and, and modifying a little bit and putting your brand on it? Or are you actually creating original, totally differentiated things? We've done both, but it's easier and faster uh, to still modify the products. We've done both. We've done original and patented uh, development and, and stuff like that. But I would say as speed... You know, marketplaces and different search terms populate with competitors pretty fast and you have to be quick. So developing products from scratch could be a little bit too slow. It could take you up for a year if you're, you know, bouncing the samples and trying to figure out the, the configuration and stuff. Um, doing the modifi modified the product still takes you six months, which is slow when you see the keyword being populated with competitors and you want to you wanna put your foot on the first page Page so you could be able to stay there. Uh, so yeah, we, I would say it's it, the modified products are still an option in Amazon because they're also sometimes, you know, offering you a cheaper price point. Uh, sometimes the patent the products, unless you're doing something really amazing, um, they tend to be the development cost is really high. And if you're really taking the money back from Amazon, I mean, the price point is going to be away from the sweet high velocity first upper first uh, page spot well, what about when you're when you're just modifying a product maybe you like you said you you want to find where there's not a lot of competition but you find something that's four or five and it takes you six months to actually get this product to market and then 10 other people are doing the same thing at the same time as you because they're using the same tools and yeah. when you launch when you launch all of a sudden where'd all these other guys come from they, they saw the same thing so how do you do, how do you deal with that since our products are a little bit uh, below visibility, we don't do this crazy, you know, seven, like six figure velocity, um, you know, products. Uh, we do 70 to 20K per product. We don't aim for necessarily higher uh, revenue volume. Uh, these products are not so heavily populated. So 7 to 20K per month? Seven, 17 to 20K per, per month. month. Yes. Okay. That's, okay, okay. That's revenue. So as profitability, we don't want to do anything that that in net profitability makes less than four thousand a month. So I would just just give a little hint for somebody who's you know there's so many people keeping products out there that are doing maybe I don't know thousand bucks a month as a profit, but you're doing all this logistics and you know communication with your factory and product cash. development and don't do it. Just go yeah. for where the money is friendly to you. Yeah, I have that rule. I have, I have a rule. Mine's three thousand. If it doesn't do at least three thousand dollars in bottom line profit, um, net profit after six months, and then I, I kill the product. Yeah, and yeah. A lot of people are like, "Why? Why you do that?" It's like because one, I don't want to manage a hundred different products. It ties up cash flow. I can take that mm -hmm. money and reinvest it somewhere else and try to get something that's going to hit my targets um, and yeah. have better cash flow. But so that's interesting that you're doing the same thing. That's, yeah, that's so we're a little bit tougher. And, and that's also the reason actually why we do not. And maybe that's really unpopular statement I'm about to do right now. But we do we no longer do European marketplaces. We are only in US because Europe, like with the previous company we sold, we had to hire extra uh, people to run all the logistics and, and stuff to service all these different marketplaces and do all the VAT and things. And at the end, at the bottom line, you're looking, you know, you do maybe 5% or 10%, but why? Just put, put all the effort to US and find the lucrative markets in US marketplace. And uh, the taxation situation is just so much better in US. Uh, and you can keep your own, the, the, the team that you're having right now, you don't have all this monkey business, you know, sending 200 units to US, um, uh, to UK and 200 units to uh, Germany and, you know, repeating that with 20 SKU. So we're not, we are away from Europe right now, even though I'm living in Europe and I should be promoting that. Uh, do you do only Amazon in the US or do you do any, do you, are you doing anything Amazon? I mean, sorry, Walmart or Shopify or TikTok or any of the other yeah. 
No? We are extremely Pareto. That means we only focus where the money is mostly. Like all the things, you know, you mentioned, like TikTok, yes, if you have emotional products, we're, we're doing B2B products. They're mostly not TikTokable. Yeah. So our Pareto is only in US, in, in Amazon. So if it's B2B, do you have a lot of, you have a lot of business, do you have the whole business discount set up so that are people mm -hmm. ordering multiples for all, all lot of these? They're not ordering single, there's... Multi-packs or they're ordering 50 or something. Um, yeah, that is true. But the, the better hack, like I, we, we don't see people buying, you know, stack of 50, but the better hack is when you're starting to see people like the business buyers coming and they're starting to leave reviews and maybe pictures of like, you know, warehouses and stuff. And you can really understand that this is away from like a garage or stuff. Um, then we start to package these uh, sets into a set of two or a set of four. And we actually see that business buyers like to buy these kind of sets more than they like to buy uh, for different uh, products, of course, because of the savings we can pass on to the customers. So that's a better idea how to make money. What do you think are some of the challenges for people that are not based in the U.S. and selling in the U.S.? What were some of the challenges that you had to overcome not being a U.S. resident based here? Um, <laughs> well, overcome? we're doing some of the products we are doing are they're not thousand dollars right now, but we're considering products that are like five to six hundred dollars. And we have an issue that, you know, if I would be living there, I could have the return sent to me and we could kind of refurbish and see what's wrong. But right now we have to use a service provider for sure. This is pretty expensive. You're pretty much you're going to make a zero profit sale, but it just, you know, brings you the sourcing cost back basically. But that's an issue. You, you cannot see what customers are sending back to you. So, so is that the only issue is just uh, dealing with returns or is there some other, other challenges that you see in your community and stuff that people have? No, I would say doing a business, like I have three US companies, it's the bookkeeping is super easy, their tax issue, we have Estonia, US have a tax treaty, I don't mess with any taxes. Uh, when dealing with US, I am absolutely good. So these three companies, are they all in the B2B space in the office space? Or are they in different spaces? Uh, two of them are in B2B and one is in a personal health category. So when you when you exited, you didn't have a non-compete or you are in totally different categories than what your different. last company? We have okay. a non-compete, but we are absolutely different, different categories. And when you exited, you didn't have to stay on for a little yeah. while? Uh, and like actually like advise them for three months or six months or something like that? We did six months. Uh, we actually demanded, really strongly demanded that one of our team members will be employed by the aggregator. They refused. And honestly, to clear up all the mess of them being out of stock, not knowing what to do, where to get the packaging. Uh, they're having, you know, people working in Asia and then people working in Europe and not being able to communicate in timely manner. Uh, it was resulting in such a mess and then not having like your own guy in the team uh, directly sitting with the team uh, i think anybody who exited uh, one two three years ago they experienced the same thing it just flushes down the toilet even when you're sitting by them at their side digitally six months and you know trying to advise them as much as possible this big machine that an aggregator is it's just not gonna be able to be as flexible and fast and and it's not even able to listen to you when you when you say something to it because it has many people who need to look it over and not not just one person that used to be in your team and can be really agile and quick about reacting to something so we, I, we had a traditional losing 50 percent of the business case that's going to be hard though going from calling your own shots and knowing what you're doing to actually trying to answer to somebody else that's clueless <laughs> i know but listen after going through all this mayhem i was actually so happy to get the responsibility off my shoulders and somebody else was dealing with all the marketing and restocking and developing new products and stuff. Honestly, it just, I, I just got so sick and tired of this category when being so deep down and on my knees with it. So I was happy to hand it over. So I didn't have like romantic cry, you know, I want you back. Where are you? I want to go all the shots. <laughs> no, I'm neutral. You do what you have to do. <laughs> Did you have an earnout on that, or did you? Uh, we had an earnout, but it's pretty hard to earn when you're losing fifty yeah, percent. I was going to say that, that those earnouts uh, <laughs> um, 
use a lot of times don't work out. Uh, that's why I would say that whatever money you get on the closing day, maybe it's probably going to expect that to be all the money you ever see. Yes. Anything else is a bonus. <laughs> that's, that's a tweetable. Yes. Besides running these companies, you also are in like, like you said, you organize um, a group of, of sellers there and you actually do an event as well, right? Yeah, I mean, we have a strong community and people want to learn. So in every, the beginning of June, we have international in English um, conference called Ambition. Uh, in Estonia, uh, we have lots of international sellers participating. It's about 300 sellers coming all together. And each year we kind of focus on, like last year we did like how to get the margins back. So it's not like people coming randomly and teaching you whatever they want to teach or sharing their stories, but everybody is giving their best nuggets on how to get your margin back or, you know how to pivot if, if you need to pivot. So we've been doing that for five years just to support the community. You know, putting out any event is, is not really for profit. It's more for like sharing the coming together and sharing the energy and the vibration. So this, this is event, this is your event or you're in partnership with some other people or I invited another Amazon seller called Michael that you also met in London uh, to be my partner in it. So we're doing it two of us, but I would say, Doing this is, is, is a lot of work, so. Mm -hmm. Adventure, a lot of work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you have one coming up on June 4th, I think it is, right? Something like I that? I think uh, next year it's June 8th uh, in 2024. June 8th. Okay. Yes. So we're always doing sauna. We're always doing fun, like go-kartings and cocktail masterclasses and stuff like that. So there is always stuff going on. Now, this is the event that's in English, but you also do, do other meetups that are in, um, in the native language, right? I do for my own very close community. I have a very high level, uh, like a community that I take care of. It's like a, it's like a lifelong membership. I, I'm not disappearing anywhere. So I'm doing that. But uh, since it's in Estonian, I want to support a local community. And part of the reason why I'm doing this is that I feel like people here need to catch up with, you know, you guys and the Western Europe and stuff. And I want to give my like a contribution to that. And I'm teaching them in Estonian. It's I cannot market this course outside Estonia. And honestly, I, I don't really need to market just people find me and I just take them and we we bring them to the market. So, I, mean, I mean, Estonia is a small country. Um, how many how many sell? What's it like? Five million, seven million people, something like that. Oh, um, it's one point three million. Well, I said okay. I saw way I way overshot one point three million, but the percentage of sellers to that is really high. It's I mean, really it's like, high. It's like over a thousand uh, yeah. that are actually, think, actively selling, right? Yeah, yeah. Our like a larger community, I think is 4,000. Uh, everybody who's been active is, is definitely 1,000 and like seven, eight figure sellers. It's less than a hundred, but for per capita, this is still very high. And most of them are selling in the U.S. market. All of us are selling in U.S. market. All, all of you. Okay, like so. We don't really bother with Europe all that much. I mean, some of us do, but we, I mean, U.S. is Pareto principle. I mean, 80% of money is U.S. And we are used to being agile, fast, and, you know, not to sit around. Like I recently just, I was presenting uh, my story and my nuggets to Swedish community. And I really had, like, and they're just getting started, you know, they haven't been active at all. They're like late bloomers. And, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, few brands in from Sweden, they're doing amazing like branding, but they're more like off Amazon. They know really how to keep community together, how to do social mar media marketing, how to do design, how to do value proposition. And at the same time, they don't know how to do Amazon because they've just had kind of like a life. It has been so good. So you don't have to be agile. But the, why the community here in Estonia is, is so big that we kind of need to get off our butts and really need to serve our own needs. Like nobody else is going to do it. This, like when we got free, the state didn't have money. I mean, you just by yourself. Of course, right now, I mean, we have this 18 months of maternity leave of full uh, coverage and stuff, which we've caught up. But in a personal level, I would say we still have some running to do. So I'm just giving back and you know, doing my best to help the local Northern European dark weather, mostly winter <laughs> surviving people do at least make some money while it's cold outside. I mean, we have to do something with our time, right? <laughs> right. Is most of your team Estonian then? Or do you As use... Funny. Like we have one Filipino, but we, we never went down to this route that you hire only 
overseas people. We want to see each other's faces. We want to have heated arguments together. We are having so many like meetings in our uh, room together every day, weekly. So we don't want to give that, give up that. This has, a, it has such a big value to be able to discuss, to take the sample, to, you know, having three people around the table and just take the sample in pieces and see how you can make it smaller, how you can make it more durable or more sturdy. You know, sturdy is something people in Amazon are so, I think this is the most used word in, uh, in a review i want it to be sturdy it's not sturdy enough because we're all trying to make cheaper things and then stuff starts to break down so you're just trying to figure out things by looking and being in your own you know e each other's energies that's cool so what's it like i mean being in this space is male dominated and you're a woman that's very successful uh, driven woman in the in this space what's that is that challenging at times when you're dealing with all these these male egos and this male testosterone and everything. Um, what, what are some of the challenges around that? For me, the main challenge is when I go to international conference, I just cannot party as hard as you guys are partying. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm such a hopeless morning person. 11 o'clock, I am so sleepy. You guys are able to consume all this alcohol and, you know, being on the top of your energy, like 2 a.m. And I'm like, I cannot speak another word. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I know some of these events, especially like Prosper Show, there's parties to three or four every night uh, and yeah. sometimes multiple parties. I don't know. Uh, I always say Amazon sellers, they work hard and they play hard. Absolutely. And I figured that gee, I can't keep up with that. But otherwise, being a woman in a masculine sphere, I would say it's you feel really held and really supported. And uh, I would say it's one of the best experiences in entrepreneurship I've ever had. I have not met an Amazon seller who kind of looks down on me or something just because I'm a woman. So it's more like they want you to succeed too. They're asking, you know, my experience because my perspective is different. My way of approaching business is different. So we are kind of complementing each other. And we're having this monthly masterminds with the top sellers here in Estonia. Me being the only woman over there, I see that I can bring a different perspective to the masculine way of problem solving just to see this thing differently. So what is your superpower? What is it that makes Egla? What is Egla's superpower? What's your X factor? I, uh, I, I would like to think that I'm always searching what's available next or what's possible next. Uh, something I was talking in Sweden, for example, you're developing products and let's take a cat bed. Uh, and you're going for the cat bed niche and you really, really, really want to do a cat bed. Fine, do it. I don't say stop, even though it feels really saturated. But a disclaimer, it's not in if you know what to do. So when you start reading reviews, the reviews tell you that people want to remove the inner lining to wash it. Uh, people want... They're mostly like a fabric, some like a dome looking a bed. So the cat feels like hidden. Uh, and when people wash it, it kind of collapses. It doesn't go back together. It's kind of like not good. It's just so cheap. And then when you take all this feedback from the reviews, you are going to end up developing maybe a plastic or like a strong case and then removable linen and stuff like that. And, you know, all the review issues have been addressed. And at the same time, and now that's what I've been discovering lately, and, and that's been really serving us good, is that you cannot rely on reviews as a first thing on product development. Nobody, and you can check it up, nobody in Amazon, in Helium 10, uh, is showing this, is searching for a durable cat bed or remove, you know, linen removable cat bed. Nobody is searching for that. And, but the reviews are telling that this is what people are missing. Instead, what people are searching for are cat beds, which look like strawberry or a frog or a pineapple or like a Japanese dish, but the reviews don't say that. Mm -hmm. So like, that's kind of the cutting edge that we are really pushing our companies to now think and grow in the product development 
uh, from the first place. We don't care about reviews. We care about the search terms. And we do product development according to the search terms and only then look what the reviews say. And this is a completely different thing than most of us are ever taught. Well, Eklund, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you uh, taking some time today to uh, share with us, uh, share your story and share some of uh, your thoughts. This has been uh, really cool. If, if people want to follow you or learn more or come to your event uh, next uh, in uh, June, what, what's the best way to reach out or get or see what's going on? You guys can just find me in Instagram, I guess. Uh, I don't really have a, like a website or anything. I'm just a seller. I mean, I'm not out there. <laughs> So find me on Instagram, Megleradic. So I'll say hi. I'm always happy to share and, and talk to fellow sellers. Um, so let's connect. Sure. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming. Yeah. Thanks for inviting. Right. I was nervous because this podcast means so much for me and I've been growing up with you guys. So thank you for having me. Great chat with Egla there. I hope you enjoyed our talk today. If you want to find out more about her event that's coming up in Tallinn, Estonia in June, the way to spell that, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but Ambizion, but it's spelled A-M-B-I-Z, like zebra, I-O-N. So if you Google that, you can probably find out all the information about her upcoming event in June. And don't forget, make sure you've signed up for my newsletter, BillionDollarSellers.com. We'll be back again next week with another awesome episode. Before we go today, I've got some words of wisdom for you. And today, they're actually not my words. They're the uh, words of uh, Bruce Lee, the famous Bruce Lee. He was talking about uh, pushing himself, and that's kind of uh, what Egla has done here. And so uh, I think this is kind of fits in line with uh, her mentality and her approach to things. Don't fear failure. It's not failure, but low aim it, that's really the crime. In great attempts, it is glorious even to fail. Again, Bruce Lee said, don't fear failure. It's not failure, but low aim that's actually the crime. In great attempts, it's glorious even to fail. We'll see you again next week. 